Can we try the second one? Will the Italian constitutional referendum support A, the government, or B, rejected? Again, I'll give you 15 or 20 seconds to enter. Off you go. Go, computer. It's, ah, technology. Ah, it'll be rejected. There we are. A high street, uh, a high street quiz offered to you electronically today. Oh, well done. Have we swapped the microphones over now for the next group? I do hope so. I hope so. I think everybody's hovering at the back because if not, I'm going to. I'm going to be announcing uh, or introducing you to the, uh, the next panel session, which is led by Eva Zalien, uh, who's the editor of FX Week, responsible as she is for the content online and in print. And uh, she has been an FX reporter for Dow Jones Newswire in a, in a past life. And at FX Week, she's also responsible for global events and often chairs panels of on FX Week and FX Invest. So will you welcome, please, Ava, Ava Zalin. I will need some panelists at one point. So if you guys are ready, please come and join me because We won't be able, I won't be able to keep you entertained for 45 minutes myself, so I think we're... Someone left their phone here, I think. Um, previous panelists, maybe. Okay, so um, we have a wonderful panel today and we'll be talking about the changing FX markets, um, market structure and exchanges. So first I'd like to ask the panelists to briefly introduce yourselves and answer the question that was given to us today. Is it time for FX to be like stock markets? One word answer will suffice at this stage. Uh, okay, um, my name's John Volomir from R5. Uh, for those of you who don't know about us, we're a, a, a new emerging marketplace for local currencies uh, and emerging market uh, spot in NDF. Um, and I would answer that question as um, a little bit, yes. You never get a straight answer out of John. <laughs> uh, thank you, a little bit, yes. Marco? Uh, Marco Baggioli, I'm an executive managing director of ADS Securities in Abu Dhabi. We are a brokerage house with uh, asset management and a small investment banking unit. I would uh, concur with John on the yes. Thank you. Lucien? I'm Lucien Arman. I run the uh, API business at Saxo Bank. Um, and I think I'm too close to my mic. Uh, so I run our, our global electronic trading infrastructure and the connectivity infrastructure. Um, we're, we're an online uh, investment bank. We've been around for about uh, 25 years. Um, I'd like to, to expand the question. Because, because I think it's, it's kind of a thin question. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't really take into, a, 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 into account what's, what's happening in the FX market. It doesn't take into account the, 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 the factors that have changed liquidity and the available liquidity in the market. So, But is it time, yes or no, maybe a little? OK, maybe a little. I like Dan. John. Dan? Um, I'm Dan Marcus. I work for Tradition, which is a global interdealer broker. Although these days uh, we don't really call ourselves into dealer brokers, more like wholesale market brokers. Uh, we operate electronic hybrid and voice broking systems globally. Um, yeah, I kind of struggle with that question as well, but I'm going to roll three words into one and say way too simplistic, which okay. kind of means no. So let's, let's get into the reasons then and, and see if we can um, flesh out a little bit more detail. Um, you said, John, that it's time a little 
what do you mean, what do you, which areas do you think uh, should go on to exchange traded environments? Is it spot? Is it a liquidity issue? What's driving this? I, I, I think there are sort of multi facets to, to that. And if I answer it from my sort of particular corner of the world of, of emerging currencies, um, there are a number of good reasons why emerging currencies do suit a more exchange-like type kind of model. Um, if you look at something like Bevespa, for instance, in, in Brazil, the reason why that's a successful model is because there was a great concern around delivery risk. You know, you weren't quite sure whether the other guy was actually going to show up with the funds or not. Uh, and, and I take that as a sort of a good example of a somewhat hybrid model of an exchange type kind of approach to what is an OTC marketplace. Uh, I think that idea lends itself to a number of other um, post-Asia crisis countries uh, as well. So when I say, you know, a little bit, it, it might actually work quite well for, for a number of countries, uh, not necessarily for spot. Uh, particularly in, in NDFs, there's always been sort of a bit of a discussion back and forth of, well, should ND or would NDFs suit themselves better on exchange? Um, I should have kept that telephone because the CME has a couple of them. They, they do okay, you know. Apologies to the CME. Um, the, so, so you do have that aspect to it. The other piece to it, of course, I think is, is, is credit. So with the new rules coming, and the cost of credit becoming far more expensive than what it used to be, or, cu or currently is. Uh, the idea of a bilateral credit market gets very expensive very quickly. So a more of a centralized type model approach to that uh, works better. Now, whether that centralized model is CLS or LCH or something like that, because the difficulty with trying to have an exchange model in spot is no one's big enough in order to be able to handle that kind of amount of business uh, and to be the sort of central exchange uh, as it were. And that's before you start talking about forwards or swaps or, or anything like that, which are you know, bigger again. Um, so there is this sort of middle ground, shall we say, parts of, the, parts of our market. Yes, I think, yes, I think it probably would. Uh, you know, R5 is somewhat exchange-like for that reason. Um, but for the general market, for, for euro dollar or cable, it's just too hard, way too hard. And, and, and you mentioned credit. Uh, maybe we can come to Marco um, and ask you whether you think uh, credit is now so expensive in foreign exchange and on a sort of bilateral basis that it is worth going towards clearing. Well, I think uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, no, in the sense that if you have uh, uh, a, a good standing, good balance sheet, good rating, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you have access to credit, and it's still relatively cheap. It's actually too cheap uh, relative to other services in the industry uh, that add much less value to the value chain of effects. Um, yes, in the sense that if you're not uh, a large company. Uh, with large balance sheet and uh, you know extraordinary relationship with the credit providers, uh, you have no access to credit, so it becomes uh, you know exponentially expensive, uh, and uh, uh, you cannot operate. That brings into the picture the issue with uh, the changing of, of the liquidity landscape, right? Where uh, you know the the major liquidity provider of the past are shying away from uh, committing to providing liquidity. We have seen it with the flash crash in Sterling a few weeks ago uh, when uh, uh, we did a detailed analysis of uh, who stayed there and how. And it was surprising how uh, probably nine of 10 of the biggest bank in the world shut down everything. They didn't do anything in those moments. And on the contrary, you had smaller guys that uh, kept on pumping liquidity into the market. Very interesting. So if you wish, the guys with the bigger shoulders are the first to run away. Uh, uh, but the, the problem is, though, the people that are staying uh, depend heavily on these banks for their access to credit. They have no access to the settlement system, to CLS, et cetera. 
uh, and uh, uh, these banks are competing with the, their own clients to some extent. And at one point, some, some of the banks will withdraw access, access to this credit, to the prime brokerage, to liquidity, et cetera. And the question is, who's going to provide liquidity at that point? Uh, which is probably one of the big questions. So, Lucian, you mentioned liquidity um, as, as one of the reasons why you, you weren't that keen to answer the first question about whether it's time to go um, organize FX markets like the stock market. Um, do you think there are problems with liquidity or is it just a sort of change, uh, you know, a different type of liquidity, a different way of accessing markets? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm, I think we probably did a very similar exercise post the uh, Sterling flash crash and, and for most of this year to, to what Marco mentioned earlier on where does the liquidity actually, uh, where does it actually sit in the market and what is available in different periods. Um, and the reason I said a little bit less is, you know, there's, we've been talking about the potential for the equitization of the FX markets for, for years now. But that doesn't really mean moving to, to what we've seen is not really a move toward a, a central clearing model and spot. That doesn't seem at all realistic. What's happened, uh, how it's become equitized, if that's a word that you'll forgive, um, is, is the, who, who the main, who the most important emerging providers of liquidity are, as, as Marco just mentioned. And, and the dynamic, the regulatory dynamics and the cost, you know, the changing cost of capital has shifted that dramatically in a way that, that other markets uh, experienced several years ago. That's now happened in, in FX. So in rates and credit, that, that happened three or four years ago uh, to, a, to a large extent. And to, in the FX market, it's happened in the past year. Do you expect it to continue? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. It, it's, um, yeah. Although the, the challenge that, that we have, um, particularly in our, in our kind of prime brokerage activities, is helping clients identify who the valuable uh, emerging liquidity providers are. Uh, foreign exchanges is a very fractured market. It's a very large market, but it's a very fractured market. And um, it, it takes a fair amount of experience and analysis and uh, heft, let's say. Uh, you have to throw a fair amount of, of effort at the, of the question of who is an actual um, valuable liquidity provider to add in this, in this environment because it's changing so dramatically. And your old assumptions of who is a valuable liquidity provider are just completely irrelevant. Um, can I come to you, Dan, and, and ask you about um, this, this growth uh, or the changes in who liquidity providers are today? I mean, Parafex was, you know, set up to um, specifically to combat speed and latency advantages to kind of combat HFT behaviors. Um, you now have non-banks on your platform as liquidity providers, as I understand. Do you see the same dynamics playing out on Parafex? Um, so, I guess just looking across the board in relation to, if you like, the stop marking element of FX, um, it varies just so much. I mean, when you look at, for example, and I'll come to you the power FX bit in a minute, but when you look, for example, at our uh, FX options business, um, that is a multi-dimensional product which has uh, electronic capability, which really provides, if you like, a price discovery model, and yet the execution is primarily done by voice, utilizing that screen. It is not if you like, appropriate for um, an exchange type model on a pure exchange basis. Furthermore, of course, you don't have clearing in FX options or not, not a viable clearing model as well. So you, you have to look at the whole range of things. Then you sort of come down that range and you look at NDFs. Again, we operate that on a hybrid basis. Clearing's emerging, that's emerging primarily on a regulatory driven basis because of uh, bilateral margin issues. Uh, and of course, could be mandatory clearing as well. So. You have different horses for courses. Then it comes down to something like spot effects, which is the other extreme. Not cleared, but CLS settled, commoditized, heavily commoditized. Uh, probably the most commoditized product in the world. Um, liquidity is concentrated um, from a percentage basis in spot effects in, in two or three currency pairs, really. So it is the, one of the most appropriate electronically executed products that you could possibly think of, but not exchange traded because not cleared. Um, so then 
what are the problems associated with it. It's almost like the product has become so simplistic and so commoditized that there was a, an HFT issue. Um, and when I say an HFT issue, as you heard me say before, not all HFTs are bad, but some can commit bad behavior if the environmental uh, elements allow them to, hence the existence of PowerFX. Now, what we've seen on PowerFX is we nearly have um, about 100 participants now on PowerFX. They come through every element. So you have banks, you have clients coming through primes. Uh, we have a prime on prime model that uh, we launched a couple of months ago. So what we have is a diverse model in there where uh, the liquidity on the platform is somewhat dynamic. However, because we have what you probably call extreme speed bumps, 10 to 30 milliseconds post-trade transparency, and other elements that are meant to discourage bad latency behavior, despite the fact that our constituents base is probably split between banks and non-banks, something like 60, 70, or 80% of our volume is done by banks, genuine origination liquidity. That doesn't mean, again, that the non-banks who are trading on the platform hate it. It just means that not all of their strategies are suitable for that environment. So the strategies that they tend to deploy into PowerFX are non-latency sensitive strategies, relative value strategies. And that's what we live and die by. You know, we live and die by having that model and having no, I think we'll probably come into this in a minute, no additional costs. So a TCA analysis is purely based on brokerage, purely based on $2 per million so you can see what you do. So that's the model that we're all about in a product that, well, the market obviously determined it needed that type of uh, menu. And that's, that's probably the challenge that Marco and I were getting at, you know, at, at looking at um, which liquidity providers that are merging now are really dependent on, uh, or, or say it a different way, rather than saying dependent on speed, they're, they're willing to take risk for any period of time. Yeah. And that, that can be a, a valuable addition to the market, and they're actually willing to step in and take risk where, where some of the banks during certain periods uh, are no longer to, or their underlying franchises change so that, that that's not really driving uh, their market making anymore. But the other thing that, that's happening is, you know, again, what has, has driven, well, for us anyways, has driven a, a, a huge amount of our business recently, is, you know, the, the, the change in, in the dynamics of clearing and uh, the availability of credit. And as you say, there is a spectrum with uh, spot effects on one end and, you know, uh, spot effects, swaps, NDFs, and options on the other where because Spot is f fully electronic at this point, or practically fully electronic, and is located in the basically three data center hubs, it's become, for firms like us, it's become possible to have full pre-trade networks in place in each hub, where we can control credit and step in as a viable clearer to, to firms that previous, you know, previously had credit in a different environment and no longer have credit. Um, and that, that's been the biggest change for our point of view in, in the market in the past year. Okay, um, do you think that um, it's time for SpotFX to be cleared? No. Anyone it's can too see? expensive for, uh, especially if you look at the bulk of what is uh, uh, foreign exchange, the spot side, and as Dan correctly said, it's concentrated in a few uh, currency pairs. Uh, the margin attached to that do not allow for that, do not allow for a, uh, a non-utility clearing house, i.e. a for-profit organization that the only thing they want to do is please their shareholder and squeeze out of the user as much as they can. For organizations that are risk averse because uh, the margin in clearing houses are way uh, too high relative to uh, what today we operate in, and we cannot afford to put more money into the equation, the cost of funding those. I think that uh, what is happening in the FX industry is that we have uh, uh, very anachronistic dynamics uh, where, you know, the FX uh, industry was built in the last several years around two key actors, right? Uh, the banks, that did most of the liquidity provided, market making, et cetera, and CLS that provided for the clearing for you know, the 17, 18 currencies that eligible in there, which were 99% of the volume. Uh, the CLS is a bank of its own for profit owned by the banks. Uh, 
the problem today is that uh, the, CLS, the, the, the FX market for more than 50% is no longer made by banks. But the non-banks cannot access CLS unless they go through a bank. So non-banks would like it's to broken. have clearing, the system is broken. but banks don't yeah. want it. We should be able to access CLS directly because nobody wants us to go in because they don't take our risk. Let me take it directly in the market. So why so, do you think that hasn't happened? Well, I think at some point we will have to rethink the model, uh, and it can, you know, you can have many possible solutions. Either we we have a sort of access to CLS, facilitated direct access to CLS, or, you know, what could well happen as the banks are providing less and less credit on the. I'm not talking credit uh, in, in the traditional sense, access to the post-trade environment, the clearing, the, the, the settlement, people will start dealing bilaterally. So I can work with ParFX and we start netting sucks or we create our own clearing house and we go out only with the little we can because of the credit lines we have. It's a mess, but it's a solution. The other thing to keep in mind, I mean, third-party CLS has been around a long time. It's just been way more expensive than the PB model. Mm. Uh, PB is so much cheaper than, than CLS. There's no reason right now a non-bank would use CLS, even a, or a third-party CLS, which again, you, know, you can get third-party CLS access. It's just three times the cost of, a, of, of PB on a, on a per million basis, or if not more. It's way more expensive. And then the other thing is, the, the, in terms of why go central clearing, there's almost zero balance, or well, there's some balance sheet cost to FX spot, but it's, it's nothing, right? It, it is compared to the rates and credit business. There's the balance sheet costs of spot FX are so low. There's no incentive for to have, have, to have it centrally cleared at all. Uh, it would cost more, there would be less leverage. It, it's all kind of stacked against that actually happening. And, and plus there's the actual physical market. I mean, if you think about it, centrally clearing FX, how far do you take that? You know, you start having to centrally clear what you do at the airport. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, to see where that would end with, without some kind of central regulatory drive toward making spot FX a, a, a very expensive for, on the balance sheet. And I, I don't see that happening. You get, you get sort of mixtures of it though, right? So you see LCH's clearing results lately for NDFs have gone up quite considerably just in the last three months. But there's a tenor in that, so there's a CVA cost, so that's going to have a balance sheet cost, but, which is why it's clear. But also yeah, but it's the banks, right? Short, it's short, it's short. only, it's yeah, only it's between the makers. It's not the client side. Yeah, and so that, a few right. years ago, created a big mess in, in the PB business, right? Because if I am a, a PB client and my prime broker gives me access to Morgan Stanley liquidity in NDFs and I trade with Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley, in fact, is trading with my prime broker. Yeah. So what they do, they send that trade to clearing because they don't know whether it is a direct or a direct indirect trade, right? Yeah. And, and all of a sudden there is mismatching exposure because one side of the trade that for the prime broker should be matching is in the clearing house and the other one is OTC. So they had to create two parallel channels for everybody. But until NDF is mandatorily clearable for everybody, and also you look at volumes, you know, they say, oh, our volume uh, went up 600% uh, uh, this year, okay? Uh, you can, you know, my volume went up only 100%, but if I move from 20 yards a day to 40, and they move from one trade to six, uh, who has grown more? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, all these statistics are very yeah. much, uh, very you know. So why are exchanges um, buying FX platforms with so much enthusiasm? So I guess, uh, having many years ago worked at an exchange, um, it feels like a sort of natural progression. So exchanges are primarily commoditized product electronic venues. It never used to be, obviously, but that's what they do now. So when you look at expanding in an asset class at an exchange, it's quite a difficult landscape to look at. So you look at OTC markets, and obviously OTC is actually a term of art these days because, of course, under Dodd-Frank and Mifid II, OTC in many cases is actually venue traded. So is Seth trading OTC? I'm not sure. Is uh, OTF-MTF trading under Mifid II OTC? I don't know. 
But when you look at exchange trading, equities, futures, derivatives, whatever way you want to look at it, you then look at your asset class expansion. And I think you try and work out what suits best to grow that franchise, use the network effects, has synergies with your existing business, e.g. CMEFX futures, CMEFX spot. I mean, that's not actually something that's happened, but that's a, an example. Where do you go? And the spot FX market is quite a natural progression on a pure electronic commoditized basis with a cross sell, with synergies attached to it, which wouldn't be margin diminishing, doesn't attach things like voice brokers, um, which is never great for an exchange. There's been a couple of examples of that, but they tend to diminish your margin and your value. Um, and it seems like it's the natural asset class to move into. Also, people generally, when they get into those transactions, they, they, there's always a consideration for uh, IT synergies. So they're, they're, they're looking, saying, OK, we have this uh, incredibly performant matching engine that services all the, the services of this, this listed business. Um, that could surely support foreign exchange. The tickets are not that complicated. The speeds are not that low. You know, that's, that's, I think that's frequently a driver. I think then you also look at, I know we talked about it before, and I think we're all on the same page, but I think exchanges look at this market and go, Ooh, there's a clearing opportunity there. Um, well, what are they called? They're not verticals, they're value chains now, aren't they? Um, but there's a clearing opportunity. I think then, example, Deutsche Bors 360T. Yeah. Uh, there's a client base opportunity, That's, a yeah. real cross-sell opportunity. So I think it's when you look at that and they, they think to themselves, so what can I look at? What asset classes are appropriate? What ones can add value? Which can cross-sell? Which can clear? You know, there's probably not that long a list. You go into OTC and say they did look at some other FX asset classes, and okay, you know, you've seen on EBS, you have a standardized one month NDS, et cetera. But you start going beyond that, it gets very, very difficult because these are multi dimensional products, not necessarily suitable for exchange trading. And an exchange looking at it who generally trades at, uh, you know, margins of 50, 60%, whatever it is, you go into that world and suddenly you think, how can I hold those levels up? Because it requires a more dynamic approach to it. And, and do you think those opportunities, I mean, I'm just, you know, hotspot sold for uh, $365 million. They do around 20 yards a day. Is there such a big opportunity? $365 million worth of opportunity for exchanges, do you think? That's on, that's on the low end, right? Like, what did Deutsche Börse pay for 360T? It was a hell of a lot 725 more. 725 euro. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of exchanges <laughs> buying FX venues, definitely. Uh, come, What's your price? Come, <laughs> What's your price? <laughs> cheap, <laughs> cheap. Um, but, uh, and and, and, and it, there's been a lot of it lately as well. It's almost like uh, the music stopped quick by an FX venue. Uh, um, there is NASDAQ is being talked about, looking there around. Go. There we go. I mean, it, I guess not being an expert in the exchange world, but you know, margins are, are, are wafer thin. Data seems to be the thing to charge for at the moment. That, seems, that seems to be the way to be able to make up for the lack of OK transaction fees. Um, FX brokerage throws off some money in there as well. OK, I think that I, I disagree a little bit with the technology aspect. I'm not so sure whether that's necessarily the motivation. I'm sure it's part of it. Um, you know, sort of global domination because it's very difficult for one exchange to buy another exchange, but it can buy effectively relatively small exchange type kinds of services like FX venues a lot easier than buying another exchange. So you've got that aspect, but it does seem to me that often it's people buying it so that the CME can't get their hands on it. It seems to happen a lot in each one of these transactions. Um, I think also it's uh, you look at the nature of the exchanges. They should be utilities. They've been privatized. Their DNA is very much politically driven. You know, especially in the southern European countries, you look at who runs these places, and uh, it's uh, mostly political appointees or related to that. They have very little vision of the future. They they grow and try to expand into surrounding areas without innovating. That's the average definition. Uh, you know, they look at the facts, who can I clear it, as Dan said, or can I bring on exchange what is today, and they miss the big picture. How, for example, you know, uh, 
I am uh, the Italian exchange and I'm listing Italian stocks in euro. How can I let a Japanese investor trade my stock in yen directly? That's the type of effects they should be involved with, but it's so far, far away from them in their understanding of financial markets that they miss the picture, right? And instead they want to come and, and clear, uh, you know, for example, the spot or NDFs, et cetera. I mean, We're going to have to give the exchanges a right to respond in a minute, I think. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, market data, um, because that's come up in a previous session as well, and, and I know that you all have very good thoughts on it. Um, even though we're saying that you know, FX is not or shouldn't completely be like stock markets, we talked about how market participants are more diverse now, with liquidity providers more diverse, and a lot of platforms are looking to market data to, for an additional revenue stream. So that's also pretty much following the equity market um, evolution. Um, do you think that this is something that everyone should be looking at, Dan? Subject close to my heart. Um, so just to be clear here, um, the recipe for power effects um, was not something that tradition drew up. It was something that our market participants drew up. And one of the elements of distortion that they believed in the spot FX market was the price and quality and distribution of market data from existing venues. Um, the instruction to us was to take that out of the recipe, i.e. neutralize any advantage that anyone can get by spending more and getting market data better and quicker. And that's what was put to us. It enables the participants to uh, value their trade more effectively because it takes out ancillary costs. So it was a kind of democratization. That was the idea behind it. So on ParFX, we provide market data free of charge to our participants on the same basis at the same time. The interesting element of it, of course, is that market data is only as valuable as the quality of your venue. So if there's no volume and nothing really happens on it, who cares? It doesn't matter if you give it away free of charge. No one will pay for it anyway. So there, it becomes a bit chicken and egg. So you have to fulfill the quality of the venue to create the value in the market data. We believe, you know, we've only been going a few years, but we believe that we're fulfilling the quality but still providing the market data free of charge. At that point, you then look at the, the value of it and you sometimes go, oh, God, I wish I could charge for this. But you have to stand by what your unique selling features are. And our, one of our unique points is that we provide market data to the participants free of charge to assist in the creation of a level playing field. When, of course, it then comes to other products, um, in an IDB world, OTC, we don't charge front office usage for the provision of market data on the basis that they're the participants who actually create the value in the market data. That's not to say that we don't have a good market data division but then provides market data for valuation on all sorts of other purposes. But in OTC world, it's generally recognized that as the participants provide the value in the market data, you can't, can't, can't kind of double charge them. And that's sort of something that we stand by. So, so do you think it's, it, it's, it's almost wrong to charge for FX market data? I, I'm not going to criticize any other models. Um, we were set up to be what we are. We are a differential platform to other platforms that we compete with on an origination level. That's very much what we're about across all the CLS and some other currency pairs, maybe 40 currency pairs. Part of our recipe is to not distort by not charging for market data. Does that mean that other platforms are wrong to do it? That's not my business, but we sell what we're about. Okay, John. It depends, doesn't it? It depends on who you are. It's the, it's the old Reuters dilemma where people used to get upset to having to pay to receive their own rates back again. And right, remember that? You know, and and rightfully so. They're not terribly happy about that. But it was blended in with everybody else's rates. So well, that wasn't necessarily something that everybody had access to. So it, it does have a value. The I mean, coming back to the exchange thing, it, everything in the FX market has already happened in the exchange world, right? Whether it was prime brokerage, agency, low latency, these are all equities things that found their way into the FX market. And there was an ITA report recently talking about how you know exchanges are now charging much higher rates for, for data. That will happen a, a, as well. It's just, it's natural. But I do take the point that, yeah, the execution layer, you know, you can have uh, our data for free if you're a customer. Simple, right? 
um, but I think there is a value to that data if you're valuing a portfolio, or you're an asset manager doing something, or you're trying to um, graph or track something, you're not a customer of the, of the initiating venue, then yeah, sure, okay, you know, that, that, that's very expensive data to create in the first place, so. But you'd also ask uh, John who owns the data ultimately. Exactly. Yeah. If, where, if, where is that, that, that data is yeah. based on someone taking risk. Exactly. Right? It, it's different from an exchange model. Right, and, and, but and even in the exchange, if you wish, right? It's right. me and you trading, uh, you know, whatever the model of trading, it's me applying a price or sure. quoting a price. It's, it's, so it's much not more, the exchange. It's so much more obvious in the FX market. It's just so much more blatant, if you will, in the FX market that who is actually producing that risk price. And I mean, so ignoring the non-bank actors for a second, but the traditional bank actors, they are the ones producing the risk price. It's their price. So in, uh, the, I don't see any appetite from them for charging for their data. So then it becomes kind of hard to see that becoming a more widespread model other than, mark, uh, other than for venues that are considered to be somewhat unique in the, in the, in the price or the reliability of their price. Yeah, you know, totally. So that's why EBS is still able to charge. I think, I think pretty much every exchange and probably most venues have licensing provisions in their agreements so over the venue derives and owns the data. Then it gives yeah. them control, right? Sure, sure, you know, contractually, sure. absolutely, you know, it's contractual. Contractual. And then but, it's a commercial question. But the the nature how, of it is yeah. wrong, right? Yeah. You know, I'm paying to a couple of exchanges a million dollar a year to have access to the data. Uh, and I'm contributing to creating that data, they should take then those hundreds of millions they make and redistribute it to the people that actually own the data based on volume, et cetera. While in fact it's a profit for them, it becomes a cost for me, and I'm actually the supplier, and I don't get paid. But are they doing that because the transaction fees are I think they do it because they, they can't make any money. But you see, they, they is, do it is, the can. issue is always the same, right? You have to be a utility so excited. <laughs> or for profit. It's, it's the thing. To me, all these venues, you, you know, exchanges, uh, settlement system, uh, centralized uh, central depositories, uh, clearing houses are utilities. Yeah. You know. Is it a problem that the market is so fragmented? Is it making it more costly to be a participant? Because yes. we could. If it wasn't, we wouldn't all have jobs. You'd only, there'd only be one of us here, right? If it was all in one place, you wouldn't need three quarters of the industry. I feel, I feel like one of the most important things, though, whether it's cost more or cost less, is that transparency, you know, that understanding as to what the transaction has costed you without all of these other costs, you know, high connection fees, market data, whatever else goes into it. Um, and I think also the confidence that you're all being charged the same, you're being charged the same as your other peers. Now, that doesn't always relate to everything, but when it comes to a kind of commoditized product and a commoditized venue, I think that, that's the kind of thing that can give your customers comfort, and it's just fair. Well, right. could, but then, but then the, the variable aspect to it is credit. Now, that was, when I say commoditized products and commoditized venue, of yeah. course, when it then comes to credit, then it's complete differential. Yeah. So obviously when it comes to us doing general IDB business, it's duration weighted, credit yeah. assisted, and there's a million adjustments. But when it's commoditized and everyone has access, you know, spot effects, why shouldn't you charge everyone the same? Okay, I think we're running out of time. Are there any questions for the, from the audience? Are you seeing people become, or trading firms becoming more methodical in how they select and deploy algos from your perspective? Like, what does that look like from your end? Algos is the question. Anyone has any thoughts on that? Maybe Lucian, perhaps, or Dan? Well, I guess uh, in terms of when we speak to trading firms, um, you know, generally, sophisticated trading firms have a multitude of algos that they use for different strategies, different venues, et cetera. And I think that what they've said to us is we deploy, you know, say we've got 15 different algos, we've only got four or five that are appropriate for your venue because of the way that your system operates. 
uh, and that's fine. You know, you, you know, they understand what we're about. It's a bit different. We understand what they're about. And I think, I think they are. I think these firms are constantly developing algos. I think furthermore, when you look at some of the, uh, how can I put it, non-bank liquidity providers, they're, they're often set up in a model where they have multiple teams sitting underneath it, tra trading maybe under the same name, but in different algos, different strategies, different ways. Uh, and that is very much part of the new liquidity provision, uh, which in many instances is replacing some of the reduction in the bank liquidity um, across multiple venues. I mean, algos, uh, you know, everybody thinks algo is bad uh, because they only see one aspect of algorithmic trading, probably the very early aspects of algorithmic trading, when you were clever enough to understand that there were uh, arbitrage opportunities not only in the market, but sometimes with the same bank, where you, you, know, you could flip in eight milliseconds the same trade back to them and make, you know, uh, out of a million dollar trade, $40 net, you would do it 20,000 times in a day. Uh, you were basically printing money. It's like having your own, you know, fish for printing money. You're there all day printing. Those days are over, aren't they? They're over. I mean, uh, some people still try. I mean, and, and what happens, the banks that, you know, didn't have the technology to understand this was happening, uh, you know, they were totally oblivious to it. And every few months, they were running profitability on clients. They were realizing they were losing money on that specific client and will shut them down. Today, they do it trade by trade. They have closed the gap, and uh, they know exactly before a trade comes in whether it's going to be good for them or not, and they reject it, right? So those days are finished. Algos, per se, are very good, I mean, uh, in, in general. You know, if you are an asset manager and uh, you need to do a transaction in the market of size because, uh, you know, you are rolling your edges, etc., you, you use an algo to slice the trade, for example, throughout the day to have no market impact, etc. So, I mean, the vast majority of algos are positive algos. They are value enhancing to the organization, to the system, to the industry. Of course, there is always somebody that wants to play it to their pure advantage, and they always find, it, find an inconsistency in the market and trying to exploit it. But, that's the nature of. And they're frequently being used very effectively to lessen market impact. Yeah, and that's exactly. that's a very positive thing. Yeah, right. Um, so that you know, if you're if you're given an opportunity to 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 move a position in a single tick and have a very adverse market impact for the for for the person who's giving you that risk price, or by using maybe algo is the wrong word, you know, a, a systematic entry mechanism. I just made that up, but something like that, right? Uh, to to lessen your market impact, that's that's generally something that's positive. But, you know, if you think about your your own pension, you want your pension fund manager yeah. anytime you know they roll their position to do it in the least uh, impactful way on the market, right? And and they can do that by deploying algos. So that's a, a, a good algo for you as an investor, right? Uh, the bad algos eventually when they go back to the dark pools and all the things that happen, you know, uh, those are negative for you as an investor, but there is always... Uh... It'd be interesting to um, discuss the credit issue around algos, but we don't have time, so we won't. Maybe next year. Um, could I ask you all to just give us a few thoughts on how, you know, how do you see FX, uh, uh, the market structure in FX evolving over the next year or so? Whether that involves, you know, liquidity or uh, more exchanges, your top two or three themes for next year, please. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so kind. Um, okay, so growth in non-bank market makers. That's probably one. Um, more and more intrusive regulation impacting, in particular, OTC products whatever OTC means. Um, impact of, uh, I was going to say Trump and Brexit, but let's not. Uh, impact of um, FX Global Code of Conduct into national uh, regulators and uh, how that might impact in our world. There's a few. Thank you. Lucian? No. Uh, uh, please, uh, um, definitely agree. The, the growth and the maturity of non-bank market makers and the maturity of their models. That's going to be a, a big theme. 
uh, I have no idea what what impact uh, you know the, the Trump or the change in the the um, what impact that'll have on the, on uh, regulation. You know, we've had a fairly consistent uh, eight years of. Uh, I don't know, a Chicago model of regulation, which is everything should be on an exchange and everything should be centrally cleared. Turns out it shouldn't. And is that going to change? I have no idea. You know, uh, what, what direction does this administration go in pushing regulation and what impact does that have? I have no clue, but I don't think anybody does right now. I'm pretty Thank sure you. Donald Trump doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the Sorry, the one other thing, just to hand this right over to you, is, is um, uh, continuing importance of, of credit and market access. That's a, that in, in foreign exchange, that is what is driving the market completely right now is access to credit and, mar and market access. And I think taking over exactly from that, uh, my, my key uh, concern is uh, the, the effect on non-spot, on anything that is longer dated than spot, uh, we'll have uh, the bilateral margin rules and all the other uh, uh, regulation that are going to impact the way banks look at the profitability of the service they offer. Uh, I was talking to one of the banks and they were telling me that uh, today they charge $5 per million on NDFs. They are, mod they are uh, a European bank. Uh, they are modeling of uh, the expected charges for capital consumption on a six months NDF uh, on a break even basis would move that one from five to $35. Plus, you have to add, they have to have a certain profitability, et cetera. So, the question I have is okay, today we trade NDFs uh, uh, with that cost base. All of a sudden, the cost base will be 10 to 15 times as much. How much trading will be crowded out because it's no longer profitable? Where the liquidity will go, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I think uh, with the next 12 months will be the theme. Uh, for longer data, the effects instruments. Thank you, and John. I, well, just running on from that, I think yeah, th I think that will create more NDF clearing. I, I think we'll see that continue to grow. Uh, I agree fully with non-bank market makers. They take up the slack that uh, banks retreat from all over the place. Certainly, um, per personally, China is a big thing for us. Always has been. Always will be. I think. <coughs> more and more uh, Chinese institutions, more and more CNH or CNY trading, I think, will, will continue. Um, I, I've no idea what Trump will do, but I'm sure he'll do something that will, uh, you know, we're going to build an exchange, you know, who, who knows? Um, he, it's gonna be great. He'll do something that will certainly have an effect on our market, I'm, I'm sure of that. And, and on that jolly note, almost 10 minutes over, please join me in thanking our panelists for their thoughts. And uh, I think it's time for coffee break. Thanks very much. Very interesting to note that um, if there had been foreign exchange or exchange-based trading back in 73 when Reuters invented the Reuters monitor, there would have been no need for Reuters monitors. A lot of us wouldn't be here now. Um, that's why it was invented, to, to link this, the, the market together. And when Reuters launched Monitor back in 73, they thought it was going to only sell to the world's top 11 banks in 40 locations, so they built a system capable of supporting 200 key stations. And they said the technical director of the time said that he would never have agreed to go ahead with the project if he'd known it would one day have to go to 300,000. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Go and have a cup of coffee, and please, can we come back on time in other words, can we make it back by sort of 10 past? That would be very good. Thank you, panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>